Two years ago, in an effort to learn Python and object-oriented programming, I decided to make my own game using the beginner-friendly game library, Pygame. With plenty of YouTube videos and resources to learn, I dove in headfirst and had little squares and PNGs moving around the screen in no time. Soon enough, I began my own Space Invaders-like game I called Orc Blaster. Using Python classes, I felt clever at designing my own hierarchy of inheritance with the general parent entity class which other classes share code from. This whole experience was fun and educational as a beginner, but part of me knew even then, if I wanted to make a real game, Python simply wouldn't scale. Fast forward two years and I'm wanting to dip my toes back into lower level programming. Since everyone knows Python is not a real programming language and instead just a toy scripting language for writing small programs, it felt right to ditch Pygame for a real programmer's game library, Raylib. Certainly not a game engine, and only possibly a framework. Raylib is nothing more than a wrapper over OpenGL itself, meaning there's no fancy IDE or visual helper, just good old-fashioned C programming like it's 1974. The greatest learning resource for Raylib is the examples on the website that actually run in the browser using WebAssembly. You can see an example of how Collision works and then scroll down to see the code right beneath it. These examples also come included in the examples directory during an install. Besides that, it's necessary to frequently reference the cheat sheets for functions, parameters, and their return values. But first programming in Raylib means first installing Raylib. I'll admit this took me way longer than it should have, but was useful because it taught me a lot about make files and the GCC compiler, like referencing header files and static libraries. At first, I couldn't get it to work on my machine. I just pulled some random guy's Docker container that already had it set up, and I initially worked from within there. Long story short, I should have realized it was three years old, and the Raylib version was missing functions from newer releases. Even if it was a recent version, this is a bad idea because Docker containers are supposed to be short-lived processes, and what I was doing was completely ass-backwards. Anyways, after I got it properly installed on my own machine, it turns out it had nothing to do with the installation or dependencies, but rather typing in the right compiler flags. With this screenshot to remind you that I use Vim, you can see the correct linkage of the header files, static library, and everything else. To anyone at a beginner level wanting to get into Raylib or programming with C at all, I highly recommend learning first about how C works, such as the stages of compilation, how things are imported from header files, and the common flags of GCC. Okay, so after I figured all that out, I began learning how the 2D camera platformer example worked. It's about 300 lines of code, but almost half of it is just for the camera functions or views which you can toggle through with the C key. I just ended up sticking to the simplest one and removed a lot of that code. My first feature I added was placing blocks in a grid type fashion. To understand how I did this, I'll show you a bit how the program worked initially. Besides having a player with a known x and y position, speed, and whether they're standing on a platform or not, we have environment items, which is what the entire map is made of, including the floor, platforms, and background, which is the only one that's not blocking. The rectangle part is just an x and y, width, and height. Blocking is a boolean, and the colors are automatically imported, as you can see in raylib.h or the cheat sheet online. Okay, so back to the blocking placing feature I added. If we want to append a 10x10 10 10 pixel block to this array each time you click, the array can't be created statically as it is now, since the size of it will change during runtime. And since we're programming like it's 1974, we don't have access to these fancy new C++ keywords, like new for creating dynamic arrays. Instead, we have malloc, short for memory allocate. This way, every time the player clicks, the array's memory is reallocated with realloc and inserted into the array. Okay, so that's a cool feature, but so far the collision only works from the top, and to be honest, I have no idea how this code works from the example. This led me to really learn how collision works on my own in games at all. Using the existing collisions area example, they clearly demonstrate how to find area of a collision, or how much one square is overlapping the other but what I wanted was to find out which side it's colliding with. And after reading several professional articles and tutorials on it, 
I still couldn't wrap my head around it until some random guy on Reddit was able to give me the, the clearest explanation I ever read. Though I couldn't visualize every step, I can at least show the first half of the formula. And yes, we're going back to 8th grade geometry. Modifying the area example I showed a few moments ago, we first get the center points of each square by dividing the width by 2 for x, and height by 2 for y. Then we find the differences of these two vectors with vector 2 subtract. Luckily, we don't have to implement this function or deal with Pythagorean's theorem because it's included in raymath.h. The next step is finding the half width and half height of each square, which is used to determine the minimum distance the two rectangles can be separated. This minimum distance is key, because if the x is less than y, then it's either colliding from left or right. If the y is less than x, then it must be colliding from the top or bottom. Next, this block of code is what's actually resolving the collision, reassigning the x and y value to the edge of the box. If we add this final hunk of code, this yellow box can push against the blue box in every direction, which is exactly what we want. So that's my version of how collision works. Afterwards, I learned how animation works. Remember how I said earlier that Relib is neither a game engine nor a framework? When I said it's just a small library for OpenGL, I meant it. When you try to get a player to animate, for example here with four sprite frames, you realize there's not exactly an animate function you can paste into and use. There's not even a flip function for when the player is moving to the left. Basically, you have to create everything yourself and carefully handle switching through frames. The PNG image you saw a moment ago was not four separate images, but one. So you have to slice that image into quarters each time you want to move to the next frame of the animation. The third and fourth frames here are used both in the run animation and when standing and jumping. So in either case, I set the current frame accordingly. With the flexibility of the environment items array, I can basically add different kinds of trees or really anything in the background I want. You can also see here I've created wood or sticks that are close to the kind of trees they come from, like birch or spruce. Each item has a weight and value. When collected, it's a single boolean that's toggled that puts the item to the top left of the screen, which you could call my inventory. This is about as far as I've gotten, and I have lots of plans for the games like crafting and storing items. Overall, it was a fun and challenging experience, and although programming in C was much more difficult than Python, I know that if my game ever gets large enough, I won't have to worry about issues with performance, and can even be played in a web browser using WebAssembly, like all the examples in the Raylib website. If you want to check out the code, see my GitHub in the description. Thanks for watching and make sure to like and subscribe if you liked the video.